Okay, in this uh, video, video number five, uh, we're going to look at the uh, formation of tissue fluid. Now, um, this is the fluid that bathes all the cells within each of our organs. Um, it has its origin in the blood. Okay, so tissue fluid is formed from uh, the blood. Um, the tissue fluid gets formed um, in the capillary bed. As we said in the previous video, the capillaries are able to allow fluid to leave the blood. Um, and uh, it's that fluid that then becomes tissue fluid. Uh, so that's what this video is about. Um, we're also going to have a look at a couple of diseases or disorders, if you like, on uh, tissue fluid formation and regulation. Uh, but that will come at the end. Um, so what we need to look at then in order is uh, we need to look at the composition of blood, what's in it. We need to look at the composition of plasma, which is the technical name for the uh, liquid part of the blood. Then we need to go in and look at the composition of tissue fluid. Um, that will vary uh, depending where uh, that tissue fluid is. Um, and then we need to look at the um, composition of another fluid called lymph, uh, which is the fluid that uh, travels within the lymphatic system. Uh, so we look at that, then uh, we need to have a general overview of uh, what happens in a capillary bed uh, when tissue fluid is formed and why it's formed and everything else that goes on. We'll look at that next. Um, and then we need to have a full explanation of how the tissue fluid is formed. Okay, so it's that bit where we'll get quite technical uh, and we need to understand how this tissue fluid is formed. Um, and then lastly, as I've said, we're going to look at uh, two disorders of tissue fluid formation. So, let's get started. And always remember to make your own notes in a format that is suitable for you. Uh, general ideas are like summary diagrams, summary tables, uh, things like that. Okay, so... Um, the composition of blood then, <clears throat> as you can see from <clears throat> the diagram, um, there's a liquid component to blood which is called plasma. Uh, that accounts for about 55% uh, of blood. Um, and the rest of it is a cellular component where we have white blood cells and platelets. They are in very low numbers generally, less than 1%. Okay. Um, and then we have the red blood cells, of which there are a lot, as 45% of blood are made up of uh, red blood cells. Uh, so that's the uh, components of blood, really. Um, what we need to look at now is what exactly is in plasma. Okay, and uh, I've got a little diagram here um, to show you that... Um, uh, when you donate blood, um, they often separate off the plasma from the red blood cells. Uh, the plasma can be used for other things uh, separate from, from the red blood cells. So that's what real plasma looks like um, from a real human there. Uh, this bit here is just the, uh, the blood group um, of the person who donated uh, the blood. And uh, plasma's got the, the typical uh, yellow colour, clear uh, yellow, often referred to as straw coloured. So what uh, is actually in plasma? Well, um, anything really that can dissolve uh, and is transported in the blood will be actually in the plasma part of the blood. Um, so we could put here that there's actually oxygen uh, there, but technically the oxygen is attached to the haemoglobin in the red blood cells. But as we'll see, <clears throat> in order for cells to make use of that uh, oxygen, the oxygen does have to get into the plasma. All right. So for, for for now, we'll we'll just assume that the oxygen is in the plasma. But remember, it does originate from the haemoglobin within the red blood cells. So um, in order to fully 
understand the composition of plasma, we have to consider uh, the arterial end of the circulation and the venule end because as blood and therefore plasma passes through the arteriole, the capillary and then the venule, the composition of the plasma will change. Okay, uh, as we'll come on to shortly that um, uh, in the capillary bed you're going to get exchange of substances between the tissue fluid and uh, the blood. So the, the plasma will change in composition. Uh, so you need to make sure now you write this down correctly. Uh, initially we're looking at the arteriole end. Okay, so that's the vessels just before the capillaries. Uh, what you're going to find there is you're going to have high oxygen levels uh, because they've just come through the arterial system. Uh, you're going to get high levels of glucose dissolved in there, high levels of amino acids, lots of dissolved nutrients in fact okay will be present in the plasma and they'll be present in high levels okay um, because this is oxygenated blood in the arterial end the plasma is going to have low levels of carbon dioxide there'll be low levels of urea which is a waste product um, and there will be uh, proteins uh, within the plasma as well. There's lots of different types of proteins in plasma. A common example, quite an abundant protein actually, is albumin. It uh, has a very important role in uh, regulating various things with our blood. So that's the, the arterial end. Okay. Now when the plasma, the blood, goes through the capillaries you're going to get a change in the composition of the um, plasma. So at the venual end, uh, you're going to have low oxygen levels. You're going to have low glucose levels, low concentration of glucose, because the glucose has gone into the cells of the tissue. Um, low levels of amino acids. Okay. Now, um, you're going to get um, higher levels of waste products now, so you're going to have a high level of carbon dioxide, because uh, that's a waste product from respiration. And you're going to have a high level um, of urea as well, which is a, a waste product of um, sort of protein metabolism. Um, and you're also going to have uh, proteins within the plasma. Now, we are going to discuss the proteins in more detail later, because uh, the, the actual concentration of proteins does change from arteriole to venule end and that's an important aspect of tissue fluid formation that we need to consider uh, later. Okay, So that's the plasma. Now uh, as I said earlier the tissue fluid is formed from the plasma so uh, we need to know the composition of the tissue fluid. Um, it is exactly the same as I've just said so whatever I, what, what I just said about the arterial end for the plasma, the composition of the tissue fluid at the arterial end is the same, except there'll be no proteins in it. And that's pretty much the only difference. Okay, so at the arterial end, the composition of the plasma is the same as the composition of the tissue fluid, except tissue fluid does not have proteins in it. Okay, and the composition of the tissue fluid at the venule end is exactly the same uh, as that of the plasma, but again, it won't have any uh, proteins in it. Okay, so that's the um, <coughs> composition uh, of blood, plasma, tissue fluid. Now the lymph. Uh, the lymph is going to have pretty much the same composition as the tissue fluid at the venule end. Okay, so it'll have high levels of waste products like CO2 and urea, and then low levels of glucose, oxygen, and amino acids. Okay, but again, you know, we're going to look at. Um, 
uh, these fluids uh, in more detail now as we go through uh, the formation of tissue fluid. So if there's anything that you don't quite understand, it may be addressed uh, in the following slides. Now, uh, the next slide, uh, just to warn you, does contain uh, two pictures of feet. All right, now the reason why I've got those pictures in is again, just to, to show you um, a little bit more about the, the, the tissue fluid and the plasma. Okay, so in these images, the one on the, uh, the left, uh, this is a, a blister, <coughs> okay, and within that blister, hopefully you can see that there is a yellowish uh, fluid in there. Now, that is actually tissue fluid, okay, that's what accumulates in blisters, all right. So you can see it's got sort of the same colour as that of um, uh, plasma, okay, so that's your blister. Uh, on the right hand uh, image, again it's a foot, um, this foot uh, is swollen, um, it's got uh, a lot of tissue fluid uh, accumulating in it, um, and this is an example of uh, oedema, okay, swelling um, in this case of the foot. So again, both of these image inv images involve uh, sort of tissue fluid, okay. Uh, so I thought that would be interesting just so you can see um, the effects of uh, tissue fluid for edema and what happens with blisters as well. Okay, um, <clears throat> we're coming on now to uh, how tissue fluid is formed. Uh, we're going to look at a general overview <clears throat> with this diagram. Um, I'm not going to give any explanations uh, on this slide, I just want to go through the general things, the general principles of uh, what's happening in this diagram. Um, so uh, it should be familiar to you. you. You can see you've got an artery here um, that branches off into an arteriole and then you've got this capillary network here, often known as the capillary bed. Okay, and then you go, uh, all the capillaries form into a venule uh, and then to a vein that goes back to the heart. Okay, now um, the capillary bed is, is highly branched as we've said before. Uh, it's important that it's branched so no cell um, is any far distance away from a capillary. So if you look at these yellow cells you can see that all of them are pretty much in direct contact with the capillary. All right, now that's good. that's important because within a capillary bed, you are going to get exchange of materials between the the cells and the actual tissue fluid. So that's the uh, capillary bed. Now the lighter structure here; these are lymphatic vessels. Okay, they uh, distribute themselves throughout the capillary bed and um, they have a role in sort of regulating tissue fluid uh, as we'll come on to in the next slide. Okay, so um, as blood uh, enters the capillary bed, uh, if we look at this point here, uh, if I think I'll label that number one, I think. Okay, so we've got uh, number one here. Um, what happens is uh, tissue fluid gets formed um, at the arterial end. That's, that's how we express it. So these blue arrows here show the formation of tissue fluid. And that tissue fluid now is going to bathe the cells. So the actual pink uh, shading there represents the tissue fluid. So um, formation of tissue fluid... The tissue fluid, as I've said previously, at the arterial ends got high levels of nutrients and oxygen, um, and they are going to diffuse into the cells uh, that the tissue fluid is bathing. Okay, so my red arrows show uh, basically the diffusion of substances into the cells. Okay. Um, so all of that now would be happening um, at the arterial end. That's where we get the formation of tissue fluid. Okay. Um, 
The next thing is uh, the waste products. And so number two, the waste products from the cells uh, enter the tissue fluid. OK, so my red arrow's there. That's the waste products entering the tissue fluid. And then at the venual end uh, here, we get the tissue fluid. So this is number three. We get the tissue fluid moving back into the capillaries and carrying all the waste products uh, with it. All right, so that's what those blue arrows represent there. Now, there's actually quite a lot of tissue fluid that forms within um, the capillary bed or an organ. And not all of it gets reabsorbed back into the capillaries. So any fluid, tissue fluid that doesn't get reabsorbed uh, enters the lymphatic vessels. OK, so this is number four here. Any excess tissue fluid is drained away uh, via these lymphatic vessels. And then lastly, uh, the, the blood then will um, go into the venule, into the vein and then back to the heart. OK, so, so that's just an overview of what's happening. But uh, bear in mind, as well as tissue fluid being formed, you may be asked to sort of discuss uh, exchange of substances. OK, now that's, as I've said, that's just the, um, um, the at the arterial end anyway, the, the oxygen and nutrients diffusing into the cells and then all the waste products diffusing from the cells into the blood. All right, so bear in mind you may be asked to explain um, the exchanges of material within the capillary bed as well. OK, so that's the uh, general overview. Um, the next slide, um, we're going to look now at the explanations of what is happening. For example, how is tissue fluid formed? Um, how does the tissue fluid get back into the blood at the, um, at the venual end? So the next slide is going to be technical. Um, lots of explanations. Um, the diagram uh, shows lots of arrows on the next slide and these arrows represent various things okay that um, are explanations as to what is going on uh, so pay close attention to the next slide we'll go through it slowly okay and uh, hopefully by the end of it you'll understand um, how this tissue fluid is formed okay uh, this is the slide now where we've got the full uh, explanation uh, as to how tissue fluid is formed and how tissue fluid uh, actually gets back into the blood capillaries. Uh, so it's this top diagram here that we're going to look at uh, for this slide. Uh, I've included this diagram from the previous slide so you can keep your orientation as to what uh, is going on really because the, the top diagram now is a very simplified view um, just so we can get the uh, the explanations in so um, we need to just look really at the left hand side of this diagram to start all right so basically to the left of that uh, term capillary there okay so all of this is a capillary but to the to the left we're looking at the arterial end and uh, this is something we have to do when we're explaining tissue fluid formation. Uh, we have to talk about the arterial end where tissue fluid is formed and then discuss the venual end where tissue fluid uh, re-enters the blood. Okay, so we're going to start off by looking at the uh, arterial end uh, first. So uh, these arrows, uh, if we look at this arrow first, call that number one, uh, that refers to uh, the blood pressure within uh, the capillary. OK, so number one is blood pressure. Now you may have that referred to as hydrostatic pressure. 
Okay, it is just the same. It is just blood pressure, but hydro means liquid. Uh, so it's the pressure created by the blood itself within the capillary. <clears throat> okay, so that's the uh, blood pressure or hydrostatic pressure. Um, next, we need to look at these arrows um, that are outside of the blood capillary. So we've got this pink one here, uh, number two. What that means is, is that the actual tissue fluid itself, uh, when it is formed, creates uh, a pressure. Uh, and that pressure um, is acting inwards towards the capillary. Okay, so that's the uh, tissue fluid uh, pressure. Okay. Now the next one, uh, number three, is the arrow labelled osmosis. Um, that arrow can be labelled a couple of things. It could be osmosis, it could be osmotic pressure. Okay, but what it's telling you is the tissue fluid has a small tendency to move back into the capillary by osmosis at the arterial end. Okay, so um, the the actual size of the arrows, I should mention this, represent uh, you know how big uh, the pressure is or how much osmosis is happening. Okay. So number three is uh, osmosis. Okay, and that's just the tendency of, of the tissue fluid to re-enter the capillary at the arterial end. Okay, let's head at this for arterial end. Okay, so what we've got is there are actually three factors that are um, causing the formation of tissue fluid. We've got the high hydrostatic pressure, point number one, which uh, is within the capillary and it's forcing tissue fluid out. Okay. Um, the arrows two and three are the factors that are trying or are drawing tissue fluid back in. Okay, so for point number four, we've got um, the hydrostatic pressure, if I call that HP, okay, abbreviate it, um, is forcing fluid out. Okay, but then uh, we've got the tissue fluid, TF, TFP actually, because it's tissue fluid pressure. Okay, that is uh, forcing fluid back in. Okay, as is the uh, osmosis. If I call this actually osmotic pressure, because it's very often called that in questions. Okay, so the osmotic pressure again uh, is forcing fluid back in. All right, so we've got one force trying to force fluid out, and we've got two trying to force the fluid back into the capillary. So when we take into account all of those three uh, forces or pressures, what we say uh, is there's actually a net water movement out of the capillary. All right, now that term water, we could, we could refer to it as plasma because it's, it is the plasma that is coming out of the, um, uh, the capillary. Okay, but they've just got water in this uh, diagram. So uh, this this blue arrow, okay, which we can call number five, that represents the net movement of water out of the capillary. Okay, so we say 
To be more technical, we say that there is a net formation of tissue fluid. And we must say that that is at the arterial end, which is my heading there. Okay. So, there's the explanations as to why we get tissue fluid formed at the arterial end. Okay. Now, I do want to make an important point here, is that the tissue fluid, okay, which uh, is represented by the pink shading in the diagram there, but also the blue arrow in the top diagram, you must know there that there is no proteins in tissue fluid. The reason why is they are too large to fit through the small spaces between the endothelial cells of the capillary. Okay, so they're too big. And that's important to remember. So you're actually going to get proteins remaining in the blood plasma within the capillary. Okay, now anything else can come out. Small uh, sort of oxygen can come out, the glucose amino acids, they're all really small so they can come out of the capillary and be present within the actual tissue fluid. Okay. Right, so that's the arterial end dealt with. Okay, and just remember, I think I've said it before, but I'll say it again, the size of these arrows represent the size of whether it's the pressure or whether the, the, there's the net movement of water. They just represent the, uh, the, the processes occurring, okay, and how much they're occurring, okay. So, um, what happens now is that the blood will continue to move through the capillary, all right, now along here I'll just show that you're getting tissue fluid being formed all the way along. Okay, I know that is represented by arrow 5, okay, but I just want to emphasize that water doesn't move out at just one point. Okay, it moves out throughout the capillary bed. Okay, not just one point. All right, but all this tissue fluid formation will be towards the arterial end. Okay, um, so we're coming in now to the venual end where uh, things change. Okay, so if we put a head in here, venual end. Okay. Um, the major thing now, if I label this arrow as number six, that is the hydrostatic pressure. Okay, so I'll abbreviate that to HP. Uh, you can see it's dramatically lower than the hydrostatic pressure at the arterial end. Now, from the previous vin uh, videos, that should make sense. You get a drop in pressure um, as you go through the capillary, and the pressure will be lower uh, towards the, uh, the venual end. Okay, so we get a massive drop in hydrostatic pressure, or well, that lowers. Okay, now number seven, uh, that's going to be the tissue uh, fluid pressure. Okay, so tissue fluid pressure, and again that lowers compared to the arterial end. All right. Uh, so the pressure is lower there. Number eight. Now this is the osmosis uh, arrow, which we'll call the osmotic pressure. Now that has raised compared to the arterial end. So it looks like there's a change um, basically in the water potential of the tissue fluid. Okay, um, but you've got to remember that when we're looking at uh, osmosis or water potential, um, 
we have to compare it between two regions okay so these arrows um, number three and number eight um, we're comparing the osmotic pressure in the tissue fluid compared to the, the to the compil uh, to the compillary um, we can also say um, or make reference to water potential as well but I'll come to that uh, in a moment right so that's number eight uh, now number nine um, this is an arrow now showing that you're going to get s tissue fluid moving back in to the capillary all right so number nine um, it's the movement of water okay back into the capillary okay now also note that arrow 9 is smaller than arrow 5 now what this is telling us is all of the tissue fluid that was formed at the arterial end not all of it re-enters the capillary at the venual end there's a slight deficit okay so you get some tissue fluid remaining um, outside of the capillary all right um, so that's what arrow number nine is showing you and just so you know the water is going to re-enter by osmosis okay so this is why we're going to have to talk about water potential gradient in a moment uh, to explain that okay but uh, before we leave point nine okay um need to write down that not all water re-enters the capillary okay so where does this tissue fluid go that hasn't re-entered the capillary well this is where the lymphatic uh, vessels come in okay so if you look over here at this bottom diagram uh, from the previous slide um, we've got the lymphatic vessels there okay so we can say that any um, so number 10 excess tissue fluid okay is drained away via the lymphatic vessel okay so it drains away via the lymphatic vessel okay um, okay so uh, that's the situation at the venual end okay but we need to look now at these uh, water potential issues okay so I'm gonna have a separate head in here uh, water potential now we're still at the uh, venual end okay so what's happening is if we look at arrow eight again all right that's a bigger arrow than number three so we've called that arrow osmotic pressure has raised but we can also state that that is the water potential of the tissue fluid compared to inside the capillary so what we can say is there's the symbol for water potential is higher arrow up for higher in the tissue fluid compared to the capillary okay so how has this water potential um, 
scenario arose or has arisen. Okay, well, it's all to do with those proteins that were left in the capillary because they were too large to be forced out. Okay, uh, so sort of at this point here, we have a high concentration of proteins. Okay. Now, the reason why the proteins have raised in concentration is because as the blood flows through the capillaries, it loses water. So, basically, at the venual end, there's actually less water. So that has risen the concentration of proteins. Okay, so there's a high concentration of proteins, um, and what that does is that will lower the water potential of the blood. All right, and that's why at the venual end, the water potential of the tissue fluid is higher than that of the water potential in the blood. Okay, and that's why we get the um, movement of water back in by osmosis. All right, at the uh, at the arterial end, uh, water tissue fluid wasn't formed by osmosis. What was happening is the blood pressure was forcing the water out, so it wasn't a, an osmotic thing. All right, but when at the venual end, it is by osmosis that the water moves back into the capillary. Okay. So that I think is everything you need to know to explain how tissue fluid is formed and how tissue fluid uh, re-enters the blood. There's quite a lot um, uh, gone on on this slide. Um, it may be a section you need to sort of re-listen to. Definitely here make your own notes um, and try and summarise what is going on. Make sure you understand the importance of the size of the arrows. Okay, they tell you uh, how big something is, whether it's the blood pressure or whether how much fluid is moving. Okay, um, I've summarised the uh, explanations in green. All my numbers relate to... Uh, to the arrows, okay, except for number 10, which is relating to the lymphatic uh, vessels, okay. Right, okay, so make sure we are happy with what um, I've gone through there, okay, before you move on to the next slides, which are to do with disorders of uh, tissue fluid and how it is formed and how tissue fluid re-enters the uh, capillary okay okay so the next slide um, you're going to see uh, two images um, of two different children uh, suffering from uh, one disorder of tissue fluid formation this disorder often occurs in children um, I don't think you really get adults with this disease but I may be wrong um, so the next slide is going to look or show two uh, young children suffering from um, one disorder of tissue fluid uh, regulation. Okay, uh, so here's the slide. Um, the disorder is called kwashiorkor. Okay, and uh, the images there of the children, you can see hopefully that... Um, pretty much the whole of their bodies are swollen. All right. Uh, if you look at the one on the left here, you can see the swollen belly, the legs, uh, the feet. Okay, certainly that one there, you can see it's very, very swollen. Okay, the hands, uh, the arms. Okay, uh, so the whole body there uh, is abnormally uh, swollen. Uh, the same goes with the image on the right. Um, again, you've got the swollen belly. Uh, that's that, that, I think, is the most common, obvious um, uh, feature of Kwashioko. But again, you can see the legs are swollen and indeed uh, the, the feet. 
Okay. Uh, so what you're seeing there is the accumulation of tissue fluid uh, throughout the whole of the body of these uh, children. So we need to know why and how uh, this can happen. Uh, so to, to help us with that, I brought in the diagram from the last slide. Uh, we're just interested uh, at the venual end here. Okay. Now, as I said before, to get uh, tissue fluid to move back into the capillary at the venual end, you need a water potential gradient. You need the tissue fluid to have a higher water potential than that of the blood inside the capillary. Now, it's this osmotic or water potential gradient that is not present in a high enough degree in the Kwashioko uh, condition. Okay, so it's an issue or a disorder really of the correct uh, water potential values in the blood and the tissue fluid. Okay, uh, so basically with these children the water potential of, of the blood is, is uh, too high okay compared to the tissue fluid so this blue arrow here is probably going to be non-existent um, you may get a little bit of water going back into the capillaries but pro probably hardly anything okay um, the other thing that's happening of course is you've got all this tissue fluid you've got so much of it um, surrounding all your tissues that not all of it can be drained away by the lymphatic system. Okay, so this this is why you get this accumulation. You get tissue fluid forming okay, because remember that the arterial arterial end, it's the blood pressure that creates tissue fluid. Um, so the blood pressures are fine. You still get the formation of tissue fluid. But at the, art, um, at the venual end, because the water potential of the blood is too high, you don't get the water going back in. Okay, You may even get uh, tissue fluid uh, forming at the venual end, actually. Okay, uh, But ultimately, the tissue fluid that is in the tissues, in the organs, uh, there's so much of it that it cannot it cannot all drain away via the lymphatic system and that's why we get this accumulation of fluid and then you get the uh, um, bloated bellies and um, tissue fluid causing swelling or edema throughout the body so the question now remains is what has caused the water potential uh, of the blood at the venual end to be too high well it's a diet issue okay and it's to do with proteins okay um, on the previous slide I told you that you get a high concentration of proteins at the venual end because the water has been lost okay well in children with kwashioko they have a poor diet and they don't have enough protein in their diet so what is happening is the protein levels in their blood are abnormally low and at the venual end even when water has been lost from the capillary the concentration of proteins are not high enough to make the water potential low in the capillary all right and that's why when you have a lack of proteins, the water potential um, actually remains too high because you haven't got enough proteins there to lower it. Okay, so um, let me make a note of that. Okay, so it's uh, it's caused by a lack of protein in the diet. Okay, and this is why you often see this condition in developing countries where uh, generally the diets are poor. Uh, you often get this um, in children once they've stopped being breastfed. Once they're being breastfed, they have sufficient protein in the milk.
but when they come on to eat solid foods that's when they get a deficiency of protein uh, in the diet okay so you got a lack of protein in the diet that means there's uh, a low uh, concentration of proteins uh, in the blood okay Alright, and what the consequences of that are is that at the venual end the concentration of proteins is not high enough to lower the water potential below that of the tissue fluid. Okay, and as I've said, the, the consequence of that is you do not get the osmotic movement of fluid back into the capillaries. Okay. Right, I uh, hope that made sense. That's uh, the first one. This is the main one you need to know uh, for the Welsh Joint Board anyway. Um, but there is another one. Now again, the next slide is going to show you pictures of people suffering from a disease. Okay, um, so be warned. Okay, um, you may not like the images you're about to see. Uh, they're of people's legs really. Um, suffering from um, a condition known as elephantiasis, okay, sometimes known as uh, lymphatic filariasis, okay. So uh, here are the pictures, okay. So this is elephantiasis, as I've said, also known as lymphatic filariasis. Lymphatic is making reference to the lymphatic uh, system. Okay, so um, what's going on in this condition uh, is you ultimately have a parasitic worm, which I've shown here. Okay, now there's lots of different species of worm that can cause elephantiasis. Okay, but they're all types of worms known as filarial worms. Okay, hence the term lymphatic uh, filariasis. Um, anything that ends in isis means inflammation okay and as you can see the legs here they're all uh, inflamed uh, basically it's uh, an accumulation of tissue fluid again all right a, a very very severe form of edema if you like so what's happening is these uh, parasitic worms uh, these filarial worms they block and clog up the lymphatic system and the excess tissue fluid cannot drain away um, and that's why you get this um, uh, swelling of the limbs now it's not always the legs that get uh, um, problems you can get other areas of the body as well but it's it's most common I think in the legs or the lower leg um, but this can uh, travel upwards it can affect the whole of the leg okay um, at this state, I don't believe there's any treatment for it, uh, for elephantiasis. Okay, um, the this 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 worm here uh, is actually transmitted, or part of its life cycle is transmitted by the uh, mosquito. All right, so this disease is uh, transmitted by a vector. A vector is just a, an animal uh, that can transfer the. Um, pathogen really the the organism that causes the disease okay so it's mosquitoes that um, um, transfer this uh, parasite so that's uh, that's just uh, elephantiasis there it's um, uh, it's when the uh, lymphatic vessels become blocked and you can't get drainage away of the uh, tissue fluid Okay, that is the end of uh, video five. Make sure now, of course, if you've made your own notes on this.
okay summary diagrams and everything summary tables um, okay 